Now the nine o'clock news and campaign report with Michael Burke. The election has turned bitter. Labour says a new report shows John Major is lying about tax. The Tories say Labour lies should not be trusted. Zaire in chaos as America tells President Mobutu he's got to go. And no way back for the dinosaurs. The scientists say Jurassic Park is forever fiction. Good evening. The election campaign on this, the fifth anniversary of John Major's victory in the last poll, has been marked by a series of bitter personal attacks traded between the leading politicians. Labour said a report today from the Independent Institute for Fiscal Studies showed John Major's been lying about tax. The Conservatives tonight said it was Labour that was lying about the report. As our political editor Robin Oakley reports, they're all saying, trust me, not him. Thanks very much indeed. Politicians need to watch their step if they're going messing about on the river. But Mr Blair wasn't just creating pictures for the media horde. On the fifth anniversary of the last Tory election victory, it was jackets off for a full-scale assault on Mr Major's record. Party leaders insist they want to get down to the issues, but they all seem much keener today on talking nastily about each other, even Paddy Ashdown. Mr Major has apparently decided that it would be appropriate to celebrate, celebrate, mark you, five years of his government. I would suggest to him that a minute's silence at the start of the Conservative Party press conference might be an appropriate way of doing that, followed by an apology to the nation. If I had stood for election on this platform five years ago, made the promises that Mr Major made, broken those promises 92 times, put up tax 22 times, doubled the national debt, failed in Europe, failed our schools and hospitals, then I would not have the gall to ask the British people to trust me again. For years he's been saying different things to different audiences and now finally he's been caught out. His manifesto is falling apart under the pressure of the general election. Saying one thing one day and another thing the next is no basis either for trust or for any belief in his competence. Trust us, beware the other fellows was the message all round. At his press conference, Mr Major praised the Tory record, saying the economy was the envy of Europe, the average family £1,100 better off than in 1992, and the overall tax burden no higher than it was then. Then he turned to his deputy. In case I missed anything out, I'll ask Michael to add it. <laughs> this Prime Minister has been proved in the job to the best of my knowledge, Tony Blair has never run anything of any significance. This Prime Minister can take the pressure. Tony Blair in this election campaign is cracking under the strain. Five changes in policy since the manifesto of the Labour Party was published. He accused Labour of falsehoods on privatisation. But a report from independent economic think tank, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, saying the average household had lost seven pounds a week in tax changes since the last election, had Gordon Brown being even sharper about John Major. On taxation, it is clear that nobody can trust Mr Major. Over the last three days, he has repeated the same lie about tax three times, a lie now proven to be untrue by the Institute of Fiscal Studies report. A knockout blow from the red corner? Not quite, says the Institute, because much depends on which set of figures you take and where you start. There's no doubt that taxes have gone up. The tax increases in the early part of this Parliament were the largest we'd ever seen in peacetime. There have been some tax reductions since, but nothing like enough to offset them. But it's also true that on average people are better off than they were at the beginning of the Parliament, because despite the tax increases, real earnings have grown by more than enough to offset them, so that people find themselves on average quite a lot better off. As the leaders continued on the campaign trail, Mr Blair responded to the Tory claim he was cracking up. They're a desperate group of people, the Conservatives, and I've said all the way through, what they'll do is they'll try and scare people, they'll try and frighten people about the Labour Party, about me. Mr Major, too, had the gloves off. Open policy, open mouth, open mind, open warfare. That's the real Labour Party up and down the country these days. Trust is the theme both for Labour and the Tories, but that isn't going to make it a gentle election. 
things got rough today and they'll get rougher still over the next three weeks. Robin Oakley, BBC News, Westminster. These are the detailed findings of the report by the Institute for Fiscal Studies. It concludes that since the last general election, the overall tax burden has gone up by £11.5 billion in real terms. It estimates the average household now pays £7 a week more in tax than it did five years ago. The IFS found that incomes had risen, but the earnings gap had grown since the Conservatives came to power in 1979. For the top 10% of earners, there'd been a 59% increase in pay. But for earners in the bottom income band, pay rose just 6%. On public spending, the report said that the Conservatives and Labour planned to increase it by 0.4% over the next few years. And that was very tight and had never been achieved in the past. The report's authors predict either welfare state cuts or higher taxes as a result. Well, we're joined now by our economics editor, Peter Jay. This is all complicated stuff, Peter. The IFS, as I understand it, says the tax burden has gone up under John Major. But how much of that is just because earnings have gone up? The tax burden is expressed as a percentage of incomes earnings and therefore the fact that it goes up can't be because earnings have gone up, it goes up for a number of reasons. Uh, it goes up when the economy is expanding, it tends to c collapse in a recession because uh, tax receipts fall right off. The Prime Minister is actually right that the tax burden in the financial year we're just starting is the same, 36 and a quarter percent, as it was in 1991-92, though then it was falling fast as the recession came on. Now it's rising and is forecast in Ken Clark's Red Book, his budget uh, figures to go on rising for the whole of the next three or four years. And for the record, it's perhaps worth stating that Britain's tax burden is higher than it is in America and Japan, lower than it is in the average of the EU, slightly higher, about 2% higher today than it was in 1978-79, the last Labour year. So is anybody lying, and if so, who? Well, I think that lies, damn lies and statistics, they say. The nearest to lying, I think, is the pretense that it's not going to be necessary pretty well straight after the election, certainly this year, to raise taxes in order to plug the immediate hole, black hole if you like, in the government's finances. Ken Clark's present deficit in his Red Book is £19 billion, pounds, a £19 billion pound deficit at a time when, as he says, the economy is booming, is completely inconsistent with any idea of a balanced budget, particularly the ideas of a balanced budget that he, but also Gordon Brown, has talked about. So that is pretty close to uh, being materially misleading. The IFS uh, says that neither Labour nor the Conservatives' uh, tax and spending plans actually add up. Are they right? This, they are right, and this is far and away the most important fact. The spending numbers, again in Ken Clark's Red Book, but also endorsed by Labour, at least for the next two years, show the lowest increase that we've had in any parliament in living memory. Uh, most people think it's incredible because the big three spending items, which are pensions, health and education, have to rise faster than incomes rise because that's what people in modern societies all over the world want to happen. If the government won't provide that, then it'll have to be done in the private sector and that means privatizing substantial chunks of the welfare state. No political party is advocating that. If somebody does do that after the... Uh, it, well, if they won't do it, then they'll have to raise the taxes to pay for it, which will mean that the tax burden will rise even more than is set out in this book. Peter Jay, thank you very much. The independent anti-sleaze candidate Martin Bell is meeting Labour activists in the Cheshire constituency of Tatton tonight to try to win their full backing for his campaign. Mr Bell, who resigned today from the BBC after being on unpaid leave, will be supported by the Labour deputy leader John Prescott. Today, John Major and Lo Lady Thatcher threw their weight behind the Conservative candidate, Neil Hamilton, who won the support of his local party last night. Our political correspondent, Nicholas Jones, is in Tatton. Martin Bell with Melissa, his daughter and campaign manager, facing his first real political test, trying to win the backing of Labour Party members to support him as an independent candidate. But the party's General Secretary, Tom Sawyer, and the Deputy Labour leader, John Prescott, knew they had some reassuring to do. As party members arrived, it was clear they were split, with a significant proportion totally opposed to the withdrawal of the Labour candidate. We should think long and hard about uh, keeping in place the candidate that we've already selected with the Labour Party. We're not Mr Bell's uh, or anybody else's poodles. I feel very strongly about this. If Martin Bell stands and is the only candidate against Hamilton, then I shall support him 100%, and so will, I think, the majority of members. It was a meeting behind closed doors, off-limits to the media. 
so different from the rest of Martin Bell's campaigning day. Even at breakfast, the war correspondent found he was in the front line of media attention. And then he made a point of settling his hotel bill immediately out of his own bank account. If you're standing as an anti-corruption candidate, I guess that's it. The date, please, Steve. It is the, the 9th. After picking up another celebrity endorsement, this time from the former Deputy Chief Constable John Stalker, Mr. Bell was out on another walkabout, meeting a few critical voices when setting out his political platform. What do you know about education? What, what experience have you had? Well, what about having two children? Uh, yes, but I mean, uh, in terms of being a politician. I've still got your white suit on. I've still got my white suit. I think I'm going to need it. This is the scariest thing that ever happened to me. Then, at his first campaign news conference, Mr. Bell, who was on unpaid leave, announced his resignation from the BBC, saying he'd crossed the line and entered politics. Uh, I'm not going back. I expect to be the next member of parliament for this constituency. So I have necessarily uh, burned my bridges behind me. Neil Hamilton, after his re-selection as Conservative candidate, was keeping a low profile, but believed the intervention of a Labour politician like John Prescott would remind Tory voters where their loyalties lay. After the heady talk of the last few days, Labour are being more cautious as journalists await for the outcome of tonight's meeting. But there's no doubt the party leadership would like Martin Bell to be endorsed. Nicholas Jones, BBC News, in the Tatton constituency. That's the news from the campaign trail for the moment. There'll be more later in the programme. But now, the rest of the day's news. The United States House of Lords. But first, over to Anne Perkins at our Westminster campaign desk for her nightly election roundup. Evening, Mike. Lady Thatcher hit the campaign trail this morning, firing on all cylinders. She called for the return of British sovereignty from Europe, backed Neil Hamilton and savage Tony Blair, and that was all before lunch. Lady Thatcher, not a renowned football supporter, was on the pitch at Aldershot Town Lady this Thatcher. afternoon. The club's trying to put some difficult years behind it, rather like the Tories, and she'd come to help her team bounce back. Baroness Thatcher has volunteered for a heavy schedule in this campaign, heavier than in 1992, and she wants that to be taken as a sign of how strongly she's supporting John Major. But this is not a lady to be tied down to a party line, and today she's been campaigning very much on her own terms. Hello! <laughs> what is your name? This veteran of 11 election campaigns doesn't kiss babies, she talks to them. And, however vehemently she desires a Conservative victory, she doesn't feel bound by government policy on Europe. Our nation-state to me seems that you keep or recover your own parliamentary sovereignty, you keep or recover your own legal sovereignty, and you keep charge of your own financial affairs and currency. Not everyone in her party is as enthusiastic as these loyalists about her high profile, which some fear could damage the campaign. <laughs> but among her own supporters, she's evidently still adored. The media was keen to talk about one of her old friends, Neil Hamilton. Why are you going on and on and on about it? What is a matter of concern for the future is the major issues. I use the word major. Uh, the campaign trail will take Lady Thatcher to the constituencies of many old allies. She says she hopes Mr Hamilton will win, but her itinerary doesn't include Tatton. Emma Adwin, BBC News, with Lady Thatcher. In an unusual move by a senior Conservative during an election campaign, Sir John Gorse this evening called for the resignation of the Health Secretary. Sir John claimed that Stephen Dorrell had broken his promise over the survival of a North London Hospital's casualty unit. He said he wasn't calling for a new government, just a new Health Secretary. Mr Dorrell said he wasn't going to get drawn into an argument with Sir John, but he denied that he had broken his word. The Alliance Party of Northern Ireland, which aims to attract support from both communities, has launched its manifesto. The party leader, Lord Alderdice, attacked both unionist and nationalist politicians for what he called intransigence over the peace process. And he called for a power-sharing government for the province and a bit of rights to prevent discrimination. The Labour leader, Tony Blair, picked up the themes of the day at a speech in Plymouth tonight, Trust, Tax and Tatton. The upbeat evening, which concluded with cabaret entertainment, including a down-to-earth endorsement 
from a space age star. We get your copy of Socialist Worker here. It's on a tax so rich restore public services. Old style socialism was a world away from those queuing to see Mr. Blair tonight, but when they got inside, things swiftly went into planetary. Space, the final frontier. In surely one of the most melodramatic endorsements of the election campaign so far, Patrick Stewart, the man who plays Captain Picard in Star Trek's Next Generation, came out for Labour. Mr. Blair, make it so. That's a slogan from the series. In fact, parts of Mr. Blair's speech seem to have been infected by a Star Trek virus. And here on planet Earth, of course, as Patrick was saying, we have our very own Klingons, the Tories. First, we had John Major clinging on before calling the election. And now we've got the ultimate Klingon in a place called Tatton, a Mr. Neil Hamilton. Something he can do. In fact, the Cash for Questions scandal was cabaret material here, with Mr. Major the ultimate target. John, John, yes? John, it's time for me to ask you your first question. Right, so that's £2,000, isn't it? We agree. No, yes? no, John, no, John. There was jazz music too, and then the theme of Labour's campaign you can choose new hope, fresh energy, fresh ideas, fresh determination for the British people and elect a Labour government for the good and future of Britain. That is the choice. There's an important point to be made about the style of an event like this. Look no balloons, one spokesman said. A reference to the 1992 Sheffield rally whose damaging triumphalism Labour are desperately keen to avoid this time. Jeremy Vine, BBC News, Plymouth. It's not just the party leaders who are out on the road. Every politician with a face the public knows, and a few more besides, is out there searching for a wholesome photo opportunity. Ideally, there's a political purpose, but these can be hard to find. Take the Treasury Secretary William Walgrave's visit to Whipsnade Zoo in Bedfordshire. Large, indestructible, and notoriously thick-skinned. But appearances can mislead. After millions of years, the white rhino is now on the brink of extinction. Bravely ignoring any parallels, William Waldgrave praised London Zoo's conservation efforts. This is the 44th baby <laughs> they've had here. So it's a, a good symbol of a, of a really good British um, scientific enterprise, which is also uh, good at entertainment and very ecologically valuable. And do you think it'll turn everyone's attention away from sleaze, which is rather dominating <laughs> the campaign? Well, I find baby rhinos much more interesting myself, yes. The elephant, the only animal bigger than a rhino, and according to Mr. Wargrave, an altogether superior creature. I think the elephant is a jolly good uh, political animal, particularly the elephant never forgets. Now, one of the issues we've got to get across in this election to the younger voters is what a Labour government was actually like. Now, when I go and talk to the elephants in a minute, they won't have forgotten the, uh, the uh, uh, problems that we had before 1979, so I shall be talking to them about that. In a cruel blow to Mr. Wargrave's political hopes, though, it emerged that far from being able to remember the last Labour government, these elephants are not yet old enough to vote. That's it from us. Back to you, Michael, in the studio. If Labour wins the general election, it's promising to shake up the House of Lords. It's already been talking to the Liberal Democrats, and it wants a committee from both Houses of Parliament to carry out a review. The Conservatives oppose radical reform. The Labour Party is suggesting that the House of Lords should keep its legislative powers, but it will end the right of hereditary peers to sit and vote there. It would replace them with appointees, perhaps eventually reflecting the makeup of the House of Commons. The Liberal Democrats want a directly elected second chamber to be achieved over two parliaments. Our political correspondent Carolyn Quinn reports on the arguments for and against constitutional reform. of reckoning for the House of Lords. These three peers could be at the heart of reforms which would change the face of the upper house forever. George William, the 11th Earl of Coventry, one of 400 conservative hereditary peers in the House of Lords. His title comes from an ancestor rewarded for helping Charles II escape from the Battle of Worcester in 1651. Today's Lord Coventry lives a much quieter life on a Tudor estate, not far from the site of that battle, with his wife and dogs. 
the hereditary peers are the ones who have more experience, particularly in the countryside. It's rather like royalty, actually. They have been brought up and trained to take, play their special part in life. If the Labour Party were to get its way, peers like Lord Coventry wouldn't be welcome anymore in the House of Lords. <coughs> Out to get him are people like Tessa Blackstone, a Labour life or working peer. All Lords were hereditary until 1958, when the system of life peerages was introduced under Harold Macmillan. That was a bid to bring some element of democracy to the Upper House. Lady Blackstone's regarded by some as a model of her kind, juggling her political responsibilities as a front bench spokeswoman with a full-time job as master of Birkbeck College in central London. Morning, everybody. Morning. Would you actually let people join a serious cricket team, a county cricket team, because their fathers played in the cricket team? You wouldn't. Um, any Conservative who says that this is a sensible system uh, in 1997, I think, is living in the past. No other country runs its parliament, has an upper house, uh, based on people becoming members of it of right just because of their birth. Over the years, the House of Lords has provided a sumptuous backdrop for informed debate, far from the bare pit style of the Commons. Though sedate, peers point out that they can cause trouble for the government. They've voted against it 300 times since 1979. But essentially these days, the authority of the House of Lords has declined, to the point where it's only a break on the Commons. It can't bring legislation to a halt. Two acts this century, in 1911 and 1949, have watered down peers' rights to amend and delay Commons legislation. But the principle of hereditary peerage survived. In 1968, Harold Wilson's government tried and failed to end the voting rights of hereditary peers. The question is whether Labour, if elected, would do any better. And if the process were to start, would it significantly improve on the current system? Senior Conservatives haven't shut out the idea of reform, but they're adamant Labour hasn't got the right formula. What happens uh, under the Labour Party proposal is that they will introduce a thoroughly unsatisfactory system as stage one, the ermine-clad quango, and then they will uh, uh, sit waiting around for people to agree on what stage two will be, uh, meanwhile establishing something which is inherently unsatisfactory and which will work less well uh, as a second chamber than what we have at the moment. This seems to me to be wholly loopy. In future, the key movers in the House of Lords could be people like Lord Thurso, hereditary peer and spirited Liberal Democrat. His fitness drives helped by combining his Westminster duties with running the exclusive health resort Champneys. Under a slim down Lords, a number of hereditary peers would be offered life peerages and allowed to keep their voting rights. Lord Thurso's happy to keep pace with reform, pragmatic about the effect it'll have on his political dynasty. On a personal level, of course you feel sad, and you feel sad in the same way you feel sad when you retire or you leave an institution or you stand down as chairman of a company or, you, or any of these things. It's like a chapter closing, and of course there's an element of personal sadness. But that in no way uh, cuts across, the, in my case, the, the, my absolute conviction that it is right that the House of Lords should be changed. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. We must grip the question and we must come up with a positive solution so that we can uh, give the people again confidence in our parliamentary democracy. And that is the great prize we've got to go for. It's not about who do you abolish. It's unclear whether Labour, if it wins, will find the time or the inclination to press ahead with its plans. It's in the Chamber of the Lords that the speech will be read. This is the theatre where ancient ceremony and modern politics will meet. 
The chamber's already packed with tears. If it does, treasured ceremonials like the state opening of Parliament would be out of bounds for hereditary peers. In Lord Coventry's view, that's not just a personal loss, but an irreparable tear in the fabric of the nation's tradition. There's great pleasure in getting the robes out. They've been in my family for two, maybe even three centuries. It's a thrill to be able to wear them once a year. And I feel that I myself will have lost something. Um, I've lost an occasion which has always been a great pleasure. It's part of our heritage. It's a shame. Carolyn Quinn reporting. There are two opinion polls out tonight, and here's Peter Snow to try to make some sense of it all. Some encouragement for the Tories, but Labour still comfortably ahead. Morrie's poll in tomorrow's Times puts uh, Labour on 49%, the Tories on 34%, and the Liberal Democrats over here on 12%. The Lib Dems and the Tories up from Morrie's last poll at the expense of Labour. Gallup in tomorrow's Daily Telegraph, who ended interviewing today, have Labour on 53%, the Tories on 30%, and the Liberal Democrats on 11 Now, Labour's lead is the lowest in Morrie since Mr Blair became leader, but the Gallup figures are much as they've been for weeks. So, a look at the trend. First, the plot of Labour's support in the 17 polls so far, and there they are, way up there at the top of the picture, bumping up and down a bit, particularly in this last half week over here, with ICM this morning putting them as low as 46%. So, quite a wide range in Labour support when we draw on the red shading there from the mid-40s to the mid-50s. But on average, now taking a clear drop downwards in this last half week to around 50%. The Tories starting within a point or two of 30%, but this week up at 34% in two polls, their range much tighter than Labour's throughout, and on average showing just a little pickup towards the end here. But remember, sampling error means that any of these figures could be 3% up or down. And the Liberal Democrats in the low teens throughout, with a range of between 9 and 17% in one poll, but when you look at the average, they're really much nearer 10 uh, than 15%. So what does all this mean? Well, at the last election, the Conservatives had a lead of 8% in the share of the vote, and we now have Labour leads tonight going off to the left there, 15% in Moray and 23% in Gallup. And if people voted that way on polling day, it would mean a swing of between 11% and 15% to Labour from the last election. And just to illustrate what effect that could have, our swingometer shows that Labour would have to shift the pendulum from the centre here to the left, turning 55 of these blue Tory seats red to achieve the 4.5% swing they need for an overall majority of one. Now, the 11% swing in Moray would do a lot more damage than that, putting Labour in with a majority of over 100. And the 15% swing, to show you the other band of possibility, the other uh, swing in Gallup would see Labour in with a majority of over 200. The opinion polls exaggerated the swing by four percentage points last time, so even if some polls are edging the Tories' way, Michael, Labour is still comfortably ahead. The political argument seems to be stuck on this question of trust. Uh, what effect is that having on the voters? Well, yes, Gallup in tomorrow's Telegraph has a go at measuring trust, and they ask people if they did trust the two main leaders to keep their promises. And the winner, 27% said they trusted John Major, and 51% said they trusted Mr Blair. Mr Blair also, incidentally, consistently wins the contest to be seen as the best Prime Minister. And talking of trust, Labour also has a powerful lead on most of the issues people say will decide their vote. Now here's Murray tonight, starting with health, the issue ranked by most people as the most important for them. Labour have a lead of 32% on health. Second, education. 19% more people prefer Labour's policies to the Tories on schools. Law and order has moved up to issue number three in importance, with a Labour lead of just 1%. Labour lead the Tories by 24% on unemployment, 20% on pensions, and 1% on tax. The Tories have to wait for the seventh most important issue, as people see it, managing the economy for a small lead of just 7% and a 1% lead on Europe. And of course, the big question is whether that lead on the economy for the Tories gives a shrewder guide to people's voting intentions than the headline figures themselves, Michael. 
Peter, thanks very much. And the main election news again tonight. The campaign's taken a bitter turn, with Labour saying a new report proves that John Major's been lying about tax. The Conservatives say it's Labour that's lying about the report. And with me now is our political editor, Robin Oakley. Robin, they keep saying they want to get down to the issues, but the campaign is getting ever more rude, ever more personal, isn't it? Yes, I think inevitably it's getting more personal this time. It's as much about character as it is about policy. Because the policies of Labour and Conservative are rather closer than they were at the last election, there's an enormous focus on the leadership. Tony Blair is the epitome of new Labour himself. John Major polls ahead of his own party. He's more popular than the Conservatives are. So each party has an interest in destroying the image of the leader of the other party. That's why it's getting as sharply personal as it is. But do the voters actually like it? Who gains from it? And are we going to have to put up with this for the next three weeks. Well, yes, who gains indeed? I mean, the American writer H.L. Mencken once said that when you start an election, uh, the various parties all rush around the country, each saying that the other is unfit to govern. And by the end of the process, each of them is proved right. I think there's a strong danger that that's the way the public will react. If they all spend all their time calling each other liars and scoundrels, then the public are going to believe they are all liars and scoundrels, and the political process itself is going to be the loser. Probably the Liberal Democrats gain a little bit if it becomes a big slanging match between Labour and Tory, then Paddy Ashdown gains a bit, and he's been careful to say his criticisms are political, not personal. Robin, thanks very much indeed. And that's the news tonight. News nights on BBC Two at 10.35 with a special debate on Europe. But that's all from the 9 o'clock news. Good night.